My name is Kevin Coffey. I'm the Chief of Interpretation and Education at Lowell National Historical Park and a historical archaeologist. And I'm going to be talking about the wide area environmental impacts of industrialization with Lowell as the principal example. Discussions about industrial environmental impacts often focus on after effects such as water or land contamination. These booms on the Pawtucket Canal in Lowell, for example, are intended to trap mercuric leachates that are coming from buildings that no longer exist, but that treated lumber for the proprietors of locks and canals on the Merrimack River. My presentation today takes a different view to consider wide area environmental impacts of early industrialization in Lowell by looking at standing structures and building remnants. In 1821, Lowell was imagined as an investment site by merchant capitalists flush with profits taken in the transatlantic trade. They envisioned manufacturing as a new profit source and hired women and some men from the surrounding countryside to weave increasing quantities of cotton cloth, which was then sold through distributors. They understood their social obligation as buying and selling commodities raw cotton, wage labor, cloth, all in line with the ethic of liberal capitalism. And while some of the broader environmental impacts of industrial society were being flagged as harmful changes produced by human nature, human action, pardon me, for the most part, industrialization was presented as a cornucopia of abundance. By 1841, Lowell was the site of 35 factories along the canal system operated by 8,800 workers using 6,300 looms and 204,000 spindles to transform 61,000 bales of cotton into 75 million yards of cloth. In Lowell, each type of yarn or cloth required dedicated machinery. As sales grew, Lowell companies repeatedly expanded, demolished, rebuilt, and retooled factories and expanded and rebuilt the power canals, which in turn consumed tremendous amounts of wood, iron, granite, lime, and clay. The typical mill building was a three and four story brick structure measuring about 45 by 140 feet. Many of these first structures are now demolished, but enough remain to show us how they were engineered. To support hundreds of tons of machinery, factory floors are carried on massive transverse beams that measure 12 and 13 inches in cross section and about 22 feet in length. Floor decks are comprised of a three inch thick subfloor surfaced above with pine floorboards and with an additional layer nailed to the underside of deck. In less disturbed structures, we see tool marks suggested of the up and down sawmill processes typical of the early and mid 1800s. The 1847 phase of boot number five comprises more than 61,000 cubic feet of beams and floor decking. Boot number six contains more than 132,000 board feet of beams and 268,000 board feet of planks, plus the lumber in its two staircases and the 320 windows. Much of that wood came from old growth trees harvested in New England forests. An average white pine tree trunk might yield 74 cubic feet of timber. A vigorous acre of montane forest might comprise 15 mature trees. Flooring was often milled from longleaf pine harvested in the American Southeast and shipped up through Boston. During the British colonial period, both species were reserved for use by the Royal Navy. In the Carolinas and Georgia, longleaf pine was harvested as yet another cash crop by enslaved woodcutters and marketed for its hardness as well as its low cost. By the mid 1840s, Lowell Mill construction had consumed more than 200 million board feet of lumber. PLC ledgers show the first two Suffolk Mills factories built with nearly 70,000 cubic feet of lumber and another 4,000 cubic feet of pine used in the counting and storehouses. 30 years after the initial wave of construction in 1871, the Lowell machine shop was still using 66,000 cubic feet of lumber every year. Wood was a major industrial fuel in the 19th century as well, burned directly or converted into charcoal for iron making. In the 1830s and 40s, the bricks in the US were mainly manually cast in lots of thousands and centered in kilns. The millions of bricks used in Lowell required multiple suppliers in Bedford and Cambridge, as well as from other brickyards throughout the region, wherever clay deposits were available. The lime mortar bonding those bricks was also produced in kilns 
and required about 15 cords of firewood, about 1900 cubic feet to calcinate 100 casts of lime. Thus the mortar used in boot six, for example, also required 490,000 cubic feet of cordwood. Iron casting was yet another process dependent upon wood. On average, each ton of cast iron consumed 80 to 90 bushels of charcoal. And the Lowell Mill agents reported using about 600,000 bushels of charcoal in 1844. By the late 1830s, iron rails were redefining movement and linking commercial and production centers throughout the Northeast. In 1830, the PLC incorporated the Boston and Lowell Railroad to move materials to and from their wharf in Boston Harbor. The b &L was part of a network that crisscrossed New England. In 1850, that network comprised about 360 miles. By 1861, it had expanded to nearly 1,700. Half of that mileage was in lines that converged on Lowell. Railroads used up vast amounts of iron and wood for fuel, trestles, and ties. The 1,700 New England miles sat on nearly 5.5 million cubic feet of railroad ties, which then had to be replaced every six to eight years. Improved transport also accelerated industrial consumption, drawing more capital investment to textile manufacturing in New England. Eager to replicate their success, Boston capitalists invested in new factories elsewhere. The PLC and then the Lowell Machine Shop became design build contractors for mills throughout New England and beyond. Factories in the Carolinas and Georgia were financed with capital created in Lowell and requiring more raw materials and transformed landscape. Cotton agriculture rapidly depletes soil nutrients, and so having exhausted land in the Carolinas, plantation owners sold their capital property west into Alabama, Mississippi, and Texas in order to cultivate millions of more acres. Back in New England, the hydropower of the Merrimack River is derived from a 5,000 square mile watershed that encompasses most of the forests in New Hampshire. Vegetated land, especially woodland, within a watershed is essential to regional water cycles and thereby to regional climate. Vegetated terrain takes up atmospheric CO2 and enhances water infiltration via the leaf and roof systems and returns some of that water to the atmosphere to produce further rain or snowfall. Atmospheric CO2 is another major factor in climate change. Deforestation removed large swaths of biomass that would otherwise have trapped CO2 produced by the industrial processes just beginning to accelerate. Furthermore, the albedo and solar gain on the landscape is conditioned by changes in ground cover. In boreal and montane forests, the loss of vegetated cover directly influences the accumulation, retention, and microclimate influences of snowpack. Rates of snowmelt are higher over open rather than forested terrain, while forests are major interceptors of precipitation that would otherwise shed into stream channels. The alteration of forest tree species diversity within the watershed also changes how precipitation accumulates, percolates, or freezes. The anthropogenic changes to that biodiversity take place in just years rather than over decades or centuries as would otherwise be the case. Deforestation alters soil nutrient balances, conditioning runoff and defining the type of regrowth that may eventually occur. The subsequent runoff may alter stream eutrophication, turbidity, water pH, and other conditions, which then impact the riparian ecologies further down the watershed. By most accounts, European settlers in the 18th and 19th centuries viewed forests alternately as either dangerous wilderness or as potential farmland and vast sources of fuel and building material. This began a deforestation process in New England that peaked in the 1870s. At the time of European arrival to the southeastern coastal plains of the Carolinas, Georgia, and La Florida, longleaf pine forest covered as much as 92 million acres. By the 1930s, less than a quarter of those forests were still standing. It was not until the 1860s that some began to sound the alarm that forest cutting was also altering long established ecologies and changing climates. In a 1964 study by USGS researchers, it identified more than 65 extraordinary flood events in New England between 1800 and 1899, including along the Merrimack and Concord rivers. While climate is a complex system with many inputs and effects, the extent and frequency of those floods are contemporary with deforestation in New England. <laughs> 
In response to watershed floods that threatened their factories downtown, the PLC commissioned a massive portcullis at their lock chamber just below the Merrimack River. With that gate, Agent James Francis attempted to hold back floodwaters that were being amplified by the industrial processes in which he and his fellow Lowell capitalists were invested. That effort was only partly successful as this 1936 aerial photo of central Lowell clearly shows. In 1844, the Lowell cotton mills processed 12,000 tons of cotton. The extraordinary profit of this process attracted further investment in textiles. Between 1825 and 1845, 194 textile manufacturers were incorporated in Massachusetts. Between 1836 and 1856, the fixed capital assets of the major Lowell mills more than doubled from 6.2 to $15.8 million. Investments spurred further automation. In 1845, 72% of the Lowell mill force were machine operators. 25 years later, just 63% were. Increased productivity meant that the necessary labor and therefore the value added by the textile worker was distributed over greater quantities of cloth. While finished cloth output per worker increased by as much as 30% during the 40s, the profit realized per yard steadily decreased over that same period from nine cents a yard in 1830 to a half a cent a yard in 1850. Mill owners regularly attempted to counteract the decline in profits with wage cuts, speed ups and other measures but were unable to ensure their long-term reversal. As I've shown, the textile factory construction consumed huge amounts of wood, clay, limestone, and iron before a single bale of cotton could be processed. As railroads connected New England with the Mid-Atlantic and Great Lakes regions, extensive supply chains and distant markets also greatly extended the environmental impact of industrialization. When Nathan Appleton, Patrick Jackson and Francis Lowell first toured Riverside Farms in Chelmsford, it's unlikely they envisioned those extensive impacts that their investment scheme might have on people or environment at a distance. But archaeology can read the wide area impacts of industrialization and urbanization on land, on ecologies, on water resources, on people, and through that informed reading, we may helpfully contribute to the present day untangling of those anthropogenic disturbances. Thank you.